So welcome everybody for this amazing session that we are having during Climate Week. I'm Priyanka Malhotra and I'm the Senior Manager on Hellman's. And I'm really excited today to have this amazing conversation about reducing food waste and the positive impact that that can have on climate change. So thank you for joining us. We have an esteemed panel here today, all women, which is also a great thing for me. But we will start with Dana Gunders. Dana Gunders is the executive director of Refed and a friend of mine. And uh, Dana, the question I have for you is that most layman consumers do not know the relationship between food waste and the impact that it can have on climate change. Can you talk to us a little bit about the insights that you are getting from the Refed Insights Engine on the linkage and maybe also some potential solutions? Absolutely. Yes. Here we are in climate week. And, you know, I, I think I've been on a journey, to be honest, to really understand that connection myself. Um, I, I frankly was quite surprised uh, about a year ago when Project Drawdown, which is a, a, a project that looked at 76 different solutions to food waste, including electric, I'm sorry, to climate change, including electric vehicles and solar power and wind power when they actually ranked reducing food waste as the number one solution to climate change. And I looked at that and I went, wow, really? I mean, this is something I've worked on for 10 years, but, but really? And so I've been on my own journey to really understand that connection. And it, it kind of boils down to three different categories. So in the first category, you have avoiding the landfill, right? When food goes to the landfill, it produces methane, a powerful greenhouse gas, and in and when it rots, right? And so that's kind of that direct uh, climate emissions. If you compost that, it saves you know, a certain amount. If you don't even produce that waste in the first place because you actually use the food, um, then you save even more. So that's sort of that first category. Um, the second is avoiding more food being produced than we need to. So food and agriculture in the US um, represent about a quarter of the entire US uh, greenhouse gas footprint. Um, so, and, and the problem is we're producing way more than we need right now. And we're doing that in the US and we're doing that around the globe. And so, you know, globally we are producing 30-ish percent more food than we need. Well, that's a lot more greenhouse gases in terms of the energy it takes, right? Those tractors driving around, all that fuel, um, the fertilizer application. So fertilizer is, it actually takes a lot of energy and greenhouse gases um, to produce fertilizer. And then once that fertilizer is applied on the land, um, it can have an interaction in the soil that produces nitrous oxide. Now, nitrous oxide is about 300 times more powerful than carbon dioxide in, um, in its, its carbon footprint. And then, of course, um, when we're talking about meat, you know, especially beef has and dairy, um, because cattle have a particularly high uh, greenhouse gas footprint because of the way they process <clears throat> food. And so um, that has a huge impact as well, right? So if we are producing more dairy, more beef, and just more food in general than we need, well, that has a, a climate footprint um, that's pretty significant. So if we can be more efficient and use that food, um, we can lower that. The third way that it has a climate impact is around land use. Um, you know, much of the agriculture takes up a huge amount of land around the world, but it is increasing in its footprint and certain and where it's increasing is often in these native ecosystems, right? So you have native grasslands, you have peat lands, which are really important for carbon storage, and you have, um, you know, Amazon rainforest. And some of the key reasons that, that deforestation is happening and other um, land conversion is happening is because agriculture is expanding its footprint. So if we can reduce those pressures, reduce the demand and reduce the need to increase our agricultural footprint, then that can save a lot of greenhouse gases as well. Um, and the last thought I'll, I'll add here is that, you know, biggest picture, we are looking at 
a future where we will need up to 50% more food as predicted by the UN. Um, we will need up to 50% more food by 2030 than we have today. And where will that food come from, right? Are we going to increase that agricultural footprint and produce more food or are, will we use the food that we are already growing? Um, and will we shift our diets to not need quite the, that footprint? So I think that's the last um, real climate connection is looking ahead. We need to use all of our resources to their best to really limit that footprint. Thank you, Dana. I'm so glad again, I have to reiterate, thank you all for coming together and talking about this because you know, we think about food a lot on helmets, we're constantly thinking about it. But when we were looking at what our purpose could be, we looked at the entire supply chain and said, you know, it has to be food waste because it really links so directly to climate change. So thank you again for coming together and talking about this. Next up, we have Carrie Armbruster, who's coming to us from Kroger. Carrie, you are working on the amazing Zero Hunger, Zero Waste initiative at Kroger, which uh, we are also proud of. I would love if you could speak a little bit about the initiative and also about some of the great innovations that you are seeing in the space of food waste, because I know that um, through the foundation, you see a lot of those innovations. So please talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you to Dana for setting that up. You know, when we started our food waste commitments, it was really for us about our hunger commitment. So as a food company, we really wanted to fight hunger, in fact, end hunger, which is where zero hunger, zero waste came from. And the tie-in for food waste for us was really um, recognizing the value of food and, and doing our part to make sure any food we bring into our system is going to feed people in whatever way we can. So um, that was our primary mission. Obviously, we have very much uh, recognized the important climate impact of food waste and have taken that on as well. But it's just really interesting the way people come to see food waste um, as, as a problem. And it, it causes a lot of damage in a lot of different ways. And so Kroger really took that on back in 2017 when we launched this program. And um, for us, it's just valuing food, right? So we know a lot about the supply chain. Um, we are trying to our best to control our own operations. So our zero waste goal is really an internal goal to make sure we have zero food waste. So no food that comes in our system should end up in a landfill. Um, we are hoping to divert that to either feed people or feed the planet in some way uh, through a composting or animal digestion program or animal feed. So that really is the zero waste part for us. But Beyond that, we're really trying to engage our supply chain and the 10 by 20 by 30 initiative and our customers. As most of you likely know, food waste is a massive problem in home. Um, and so what can we do to drive innovation in our products that will help um, customers waste less in their homes? So shelf life extension is a really powerful tool that we can bring to reduce our own waste, but also reduce waste for customers at home. Um, as you know, sometimes those avocados or those or those grapes get left in the back of the fridge or um, in the pantry. And so what can we do to make sure that they'll still be there and be ready to eat in the next three to five days? So it's one of the innovations we're really passionate about on the merchandising side. What can we do to extend shelf life? We're also really driving inventory management. So as Dana mentioned before, like just preventing that surplus from happening to begin with is really, really important to us. So what can we do to bring in the right amount of product to make sure we're always stocked for our customers, but not have an over surplus that creates a problem? Recognizing we will always have that um, little bit of surplus um, to, in order to remain stocked. That's where our food donation program really comes in and plays an integral part. On the foundation side, we are, um, we do have an amazing two cohorts of organizations that are fighting food waste in their own unique ways. Our first cohort was really diverse and included um, food distribution groups like Replate um, and then even technologies um, like Mobius, which was actually taking food waste to, to make new material um, and then bringing products to market. And so some of that cohort and then really our second cohort was focused around um, bringing upcycled products to the forefront or surplus products that weren't going to be um, harvested into market. So Imperfect Foods, who's on this call, was one of our first cohort members and really, really important to us to make sure that all the food that's produced here in the U.S. has a home, whether that's on our shelves or through a, a program like Imperfect or through new product innovation, like some of our other cohort members. So I'd love for you guys to check out the Zero Hunger, Zero Waste Foundation um, and all that they're doing to drive that innovation into the market. 
Thank you, Carrie. And I'm, I'm really grateful that, uh, you know, you agreed on from the foundation side to partner with Hellman's on our Make Taste Not Waste initiative, Absolutely. which is also very focused on ingredients that you find in your fridge and how you can repurpose them and make them into delicious meals. So thank you very much for that. Yeah. Next, we'll move on to Madeline Rotman, Maddie. Um, who is coming to us as a sustainability head of Imperfect Foods. So the question I have for you, um, Maddie, is that how do you balance this mission of creating awareness of the markets of imperfects uh, versus the desire to, be, uh, you know, this variety and the op options that you need being a retailer? So how do you balance that? Yeah, I mean, it's been a journey. And, you know, from what Dana said and Carrie said, where we started six years ago was around what Dana's talking about of we saw this huge problem in the market of, okay, there's so much food at the farm level that growers don't have a market for. And how can we be that player? How can we be that connector between what is being left in the field and what consumers are asking for, which is just delicious fresh food. And so we built our business, um, Imperfect, you know, so direct to consumer model. Um, of weekly groceries from that point of how can we pick up excess and surplus sort of imperfect food that doesn't hit regular grocery store standards because it's maybe too small or too big um, or a little scarred or a little bruised because of climate patterns and how can we bring that to customers? And through this journey to today, we really expanded from being just this opportunistic buyer to sort of blending consistency with opportunistic. And a lot of it has to do with us understanding more of the market. So as we get deeper into how can we save more food, we found ourselves in new categories like pantry and like grocery items. Um, and a lot of it's some flexibility. So, you know, one of my favorite products that I talk about often is our chocolate pretzel bits, because what we've done is we've gone to the pretzel manufacturers who bag most pretzels for a lot of the retailers across the country, and they have all the broken bits that fall to the bottom. And they're actually dumping those prior. And so what we do is we capture those, cover them in chocolate, and those are our imperfect um, dark chocolate covered pretzel pieces. And so it's this idea of how can we take the same model that we've started on the produce side around being opportunistic and being flexible for growers, and how can we also take that into the supply chains of more manufactured products, whether it's you know salmon um, end cuts, so they're not all perfect fillets, or they're these chocolate pretzel bits, um, or even you know there's always new things coming out, and sort of partnering with these upcycled um, folks who are doing you know. Renewal Mill, for example, has incredible flour that we're putting into Imperfect Foods cookies that are coming from um, different byproducts of different productions of items and specifically soy milk and oat milk. And so there's all these ways of partnership across all these aisles, whether it's the folks in this call or these other companies that are enabling sort of Imperfect to say, how can we look across the entire food system that is built on consistency, specifically the retail market, and consumers are expecting consistency. And how can we sort of flip that to say it's broken? We've created the number one problem and now solution to mitigating climate change, which is eliminating food waste. And how can we do that across many different avenues? So we started on just saving fruits and veggies, and now we've sort of uh, you know, twisted that and evolved that into saying, how can we save more food? And it doesn't always look the same. <laughs> so sometimes it's our imperfect fruits and veggies, Sometimes it's our, uh, you know, upcycled private label items. And sometimes it's opportunistic. Um, we call them opportunity buys of different items in the supply chain that have sort of excess or surplus or don't have markets. And how can we save those? Um, you know, through this pandemic, we've seen a lot of that with all of these supply chains getting shut down, whether it was, you know, uh, you know 20, over 20,000 pounds of tuna that we bought that was intended to go to cruise ships or different broccolis or um, that was going to institutional, uh, you know, cafeterias, and even movie theater popcorn that was going to movie theaters. So how can we be that sort of player in the supply chain that's always being a little flexible? And we have consistency for customers, it just looks different than the consistency we're used to as customers. And so sort of playing with that idea for consumers of how can we make it fun and educational and use our e-commerce platform to tell you the story so you feel engaged and you feel like you can be part of the solution through shopping with us, but also being realistic of consistency is not the answer anymore and we need to do something radically different. Um, and so that's sort of how we're playing with how can we be what customers are looking for, but also shift consumer behavior. That's fantastic. And coming from the innovation business, this is like so innovative and, and really remarkable. Thank you, Maddie, for sharing 
the story and the journey of, of uh, Imperfect Foods. So next we have Emily Broadleaf, who's coming from the world of academia, uh, from the Harvard Law and Policy Clinic. And we are working very closely together on Anne Hellman's and, and Emily on date labeling. But I would love, uh, Emily, for you to talk about uh, what are those things that you are super excited about in the space of policy and some advancements that you are seeing that are coming through uh, on the policy side. Of course, you can specifically speak to date labeling, but you know, I'd love to hear from you about that. Thank you. Um, it's amazing to be on this wonderful panel. I also am very inspired by all these amazing women and sharing the stage, so to speak, with all of you. Um, so, you know, I think just to say my organization is the Food Law and Policy Clinic at Harvard Law School. And what that means is that we research and provide guidance to businesses, NGOs, and government really at all levels on a range of food issues, but we've had historically a very big practice and a very big focus on food waste and food recovery. And I think it's helpful also to say a little like why policy matters so much, because of course there's so much innovation. I mean, you just heard like all the things that Perfect is doing, you know, there's a role for all of these players, but I think the policy climate can be really important because um, first, there's often confusion over the laws that presents a barrier, or sometimes the laws themselves pose a barrier by making something really costly that, you know, should be, you know, a habit we'd want businesses to have in terms of re you know, recovering food and donating it or upcycling it, etc. And also policy can help align incentives and make it really, you know, encourage businesses and, and nonprofits and academic institutions to make these like long-term investments in food recovery and food waste reduction. So in terms of what's going on in the US, it's been um, kind of a snowball the last five or so years, starting from in 2015, announcing the first ever US food waste reduction goal, which was done by USDA and EPA. Um, the 2018 Farm Bill, which was, you know, the Farm Bill is like this huge pot of money that we spend on food and agriculture. And prior to that time, not a dollar of that went to food waste reduction or food recovery. That was the first farm ball ever that really put a lot of resources into programming and staffing to start um, thinking about this. Um, in 2019, FDA, USDA, and EPA announced an interagency strategy um, that they're really partnering on doing this. And then the new administration and new Congress as part of a focus on climate, you know, going back to what Dana was talking about, I think are really seeing these opportunities. Um, so a couple of like really exciting things right now. First is in April of this year, um, my organization along with ReFed and NRDC and WWF and with 50 other signatories, including Hellman's and Unilever, put out a food loss and waste action plan for what we think um, Congress and the agencies in the White House should be doing right now on driving, using policy to really drive change in this space. Um, so we cover kind of a range of areas, including prevention, um, enabling donation, um, a specific call out on um, uh, standardizing date labels, which I'll talk about, um, and you know, a couple other areas. And I think we've now been really committed to trying to drive change on those. So I'm gonna mention two really quick and we can come back in questions. One that I'm really excited about is standardizing date labeling. Um, federal law in the US doesn't have any standards for date labels. And as a result, uh, 41 states have all different rules. No two states have the same rule on what those labels should be on packages. And there's like more than 50 different label language in use around the country. Um, and in fact, REFED found that standardizing date labels was one of the top five most cost-effective and impactful policy opportunities for food waste, partly because everyone, every company is putting labels on food now, and it's very um, not very costly to just change that language and make it standardized. Uh, so legislation has been introduced in the last few Congresses. I want to give a call out especially to Representatives Pingree and Newhouse and Senator Blumenthal, who have been um, really champions of this, even when it was early on. And I think new legislation is going to be introduced in the coming months that um, we're hoping to get some momentum because this is just a really, um, you know, cost-effective, sensible thing to do. Um, so the legislation would standardize those labels to have one that really is clear about food that um, might increase in safety risk after the date. So people can be really clear, like eat this before the date, make that a priority. And if it's after the date, you might not want to use it. 
And then by contrast, the large majority of foods where there's no safety risk after the date would have a different label um, best if used by, which is really, you know, as long as it tastes good and smells good, don't, you know, there's not a risk, you can eat this, you should be able to donate it. Um, so that's kind of the main thing. There's some other elements of that, but, you know, we have more Q&A. I want to quickly mention just one other area, which is the first recommendation in our food waste action plan, which was calling for funding for states and localities to implement policies that reduce waste going to landfill. So like organic waste bans or landfill taxes or pay as you throw. I mean, there's lots of like proven tested policies um, and states and localities know what's gonna work there. Um, so we were able to work with representatives Brownlee, Custer, Pingree and Senator Booker to introduce the Zero Food Waste Act, which would really provide funding for that. And the exciting update is that a piece of that kind of funding for those things was included in the reconciliation bill that came out of the House Energy and Commerce Committee. So it would be funding for a range of waste reduction activities, including specific funding for infrastructure for organics recycling and you know, creating uh, market demand for compost, et cetera. So those are, you know, there's a lot, but those are two that I'm really excited about. It feels like there's momentum. We have a lot of partner support, including working with Hellman's, which is great. So thank you. Thank you, Emily, and thank you so much for your partnership and for educating all of us about standardized date labeling because I, I didn't myself realize how much of an issue it is and how many Americans are confused with the matter uh, on it. So thank you very much. And next we have Eve Turopal. So Eve, you are the linchpin. You bring all of this together. Eve is the founder of, of, of Food for Climate Change. Did I say that right? Food for Climate Change. League. League. Yeah. Food for Climate League. Um, Tell us, Eve, that what are some of the critical aspects of this narrative that must be emphasized to the everyday consumer, to the everyday person that empowers them versus discourages them? Yeah, so it's a great question. And I've spent the last 10 plus years now doing research on millennial and Gen Z food behaviors and really analyzing why it is that young people are spending their discretionary time and income the way that they are. And then two years ago, I founded Food for Climate League with support from the Google Food Program, really to help shift that narrative, because I was seeing this hunger, this need in the young people I was interviewing all around the world, concern about the climate crisis, obsession with food, yet really this fatalistic attitude, whether I was talking to someone in Seoul or in Sonoma County, California, saying, well, I'm going to spend my money on really great meals out because I don't know if I wanna buy a house, I don't know if I wanna have kids because I'm so terrified of the climate crisis. Yet they weren't connecting the dots between the fact that they actually have immense power as eaters, right? Which is what Dana was talking about, right? This is the number one most important thing that we can do to combat the climate crisis. We don't need to wait on politicians or big companies to take this on. It's amazing if they do, but really each and every one of us can be stakeholders, but that's not how it's being talked about right now. So at Food for Climate League, we really focus in on narrative, right? Even the term food waste, it really is framed in the negative instead of the positive. So there are all of these benefits to limiting food waste that people aren't really talking about as much as we believe that they should be. First and foremost, this is cost savings. Right? We're talking about not throwing out money every single day, every single year. A lot of this can really add up over time. And often it's because these date labels are confusing for people. Sometimes there's date labels on stuff that don't even expire. I've seen labels on honey. You can eat that forever. Um, I go by the smell test, um, as Emily was talking about with a lot of these foods. But it's also just simply a culture of, of really a lack of education of even parts of plants that we can be eating. Um, that were not. I remember publishing a, a, a recipe once that used broccoli stems and the kale ribs, roasting them. And I got messages from people like, what, you can eat this? Yes, you can eat it. Um, you don't need to be throwing it away. So part of this is about control. It's cost savings. The other part that we really should be emphasizing is community, really the flavors, the new things to cook with, the new kind of cultural heritages of cooking certain things. I have a contact in India who told me that he was stir frying uh, tomato leaves in with eggs. And I was, my mind was blown. I've been growing tomatoes for years. I had no idea I could eat the leaves. There are all of these kind of culinary gustatory explorations that we can be going on. We're a world of foodies now. Um, we should be leveraging this. And I also loved what Maddie said that consistency is not the answer anymore. 
right? We have this expectation that you can buy the same thing year round, no matter what. And it's going to look the same no matter what. But what does really well right now? Limited time offers. What we're talking about is like making everything a limited time offer. <laughs> it's available in season, right? Come and get it while it's great, while it's really good. And then it's going to last longer in your fridge. And then the last part of this is about creating a sense of purpose and meaning. Oh, so many people right now are feeling fatalistic about the climate. There's been a number of new reports coming out. Hartman Group just released a new report. Uh, Yale releases um, uh, content on this often, kind of surveying the American public on their feelings about the climate crisis. We do it as well through Food for Climate League. It's fear. People are scared. Um, they don't feel like they have the autonomy to do anything, but we do. Every single one of us as eaters do. And I think that actually the foodie millennial movement is a great example of just how much power we have as eaters to shift the food system. Think about avocado toast and the number of avocados that are now being grown around the world. That's not necessarily a benefit to the climate, but think about if we use that energy and that momentum and that spending power to really drive the marketplace to these diversified foods, in-season foods that are gonna last longer in our fridges. And also even putting, um, asking for all of the different elements of the plant that are being left on the farm field as well. And you know, once people know how to cook this at home, it's not going to be wasted. Um, it's creating additional marketplace, additional income as well for, um, for farmers. A couple of years ago, I had the pleasure of being in the documentary Wasted, um, which was created by Zero Point Zero Productions, and it was at Tribeca Film Festival. Super fun to go to the screenings. I got to tell you, though, oftentimes after the screenings, people would come up to me and be like, OK, I get that this is a problem. I'm inspired by these solutions happening on a grand scale in other countries around the world. What do I do as an individual? Like, tell me what to do today. And I think that this really is about creating that sense of autonomy and empowerment with really direct initiatives for people that doesn't seem like a heavy burden, which is why what Emily's talking about is so exciting, right? If we can have government assistance to help people compost where that just becomes the thing that you do, right? You don't need to pay to get someone to pick up your compost. It can seriously change not just the level of food waste, but also people's sense of, of empowerment and purpose in their lives. That's really so, uh, so uplifting, Eve, because that, you know, we, it's beautiful. The three, four things I heard was empowering exploration, which we all love to do. Um, and, and just like it, creating the sense of purpose that each one of us can actually make an impact. And I, I think that's so beautiful. And thank you for that, Eve. Thank you for sharing. So um, we have such an esteemed panel. Um, I'm going to open up a question and then, you know, a couple of you can jump in and answer that question. And, and I know all of you can, but um, can you talk through how partnering across industry, nonprofits, academia is helping advance uh, food security and limit waste? So maybe we'll start, Emily, should we start with you? Sure. And it's a good opportunity to say something I should I meant to say in my opening, which was a big shout out also to Dana, um, which who has been a partner in crime on date labels since, you know, almost 10 years now. Okay. Um, so I think just that in that case, it was, you know, using the academic platform. And, you know, I think we have a reputation for doing objective research, putting out good information. We have access to the best libraries and students. And in that case, we worked with um, when Dana was at NRDC to really look at the question of like, what are these date labels, you know, answering once and for all the question that lots of folks had asked, which was, you know, we should understand what these mean because they could be a key to food waste. And we sort of dug in and really did it. And I should give a shout out also to the dozens of students who spent lots of time working on it, including pulling basically an all nighter the night before our first report came out, just double checking some of the state things. Um, and then now we're having a great opportunity working with Hellman's you know, taking the knowledge we've accumulated over years on this legal space, the challenges, and then really like what it would take to make a, a you know, cost-effective law that has consensus, um, and then kind of partnering with, you know, a really forward-thinking um, business that's sort of saying, you know, being able to say to Congress, this is doable, we can tell you from the industry side, we can do this, and, you know, so I think those are just two examples, but I would say, you know, 
I'm conscious all the time of, you know, the, the power we can have in academia when we partner with others. And, um, and also as a lawyer, like, you know, that's a tool and the tool is only powerful when we work with others that really have information about how it can be applied and, and um, what the goals are. Awesome. Yeah, I, I would just add to that, you know, Kroger, uh, when we launched Zero Hunger, Zero Waste, the first thing we said was like, we want to work on this issue, but we know we can't do it alone, right? So like, we can control our own operations to an extent, but um, like you said, like, this is going to take everyone, like everyone has a responsibility to take action on this issue. Um, and being able to do that in partnership with academia or policymakers or nonprofits is really, really vital. So like, Kroger has public policy in our action plan for zero hunger, zero waste. And it's generally on a local level, working with our local partners to make sure that um, we're removing any barriers to achieve these goals, but also on a federal level, like working with the farm bill um, and the and all of that. So I think um, acknowledging that there's no other way to do it than to partner across industries is really, really important too. Dana, did you yeah, I would jump in there. Um, you know, I think there's sort of two key ways where working together is key. One is what um, both Emily and Carrie are mentioning, and we, and all of us here on this, you know, work together so closely. So I think just that fact is is a um, is of note. But uh, you know, one is to have a stronger voice, right? And certainly in policy issues, but not just policy issues. You know, in trying to raise awareness, I think seeing that um, that there is a reason for different types of people to work on this is really important because people need to see themselves in the solutions, right? So I think there's that. But also, um, you know, I mean, you have Carrie over at Kroger trying to work on this issue, but she also has 15 other things on her plate, right? And, you know, I think there's a lot of of businesses and governments who want to be doing something right on this, but don't necessarily know what to do. And they shouldn't have to start from scratch and they shouldn't have to spend all their time figuring that out because there are other people who wake up every day, you know, and try to find solutions and, and what we can do on this. And we can only identify those solutions if we have good examples. And so there's a real partnership there, right? We need to be looking around and finding businesses and others who, um, who are, who are creating solutions and implementing them and finding they work. And then we need to take that and provide guidance to everyone else and say, hey, look, look, this is working, right? And there's a real um, interchange there of, of information and success stories and energy and momentum that comes out of everyone working together and, and being able to, and willing to kind of um, exchange information and ideas and data, frankly. Thank you, Dana. Thank you, Carrie. Thanks, Emily. So um, some of the things you talked about, Eve, and also Maddie, you talked about is culture, really, how do we change the culture, right? So in many ways, the root of our American culture is has a very strong preference for abundance, just having a lot. Um, and that's obviously also, you know, in sort of contrast, challenging the way we want to address food waste and, and food security. So in what ways do you see, and maybe Eve, we'll start with you and then we'll go uh, to you, Maddie. In what ways can, can and will culture shift in addressing the climate crisis through food? Yeah, so it's a, it's a really important question. And I, I think actually Maddie's pretzel bits that she was talking about are a good example of this. They're awesome. I will give a plug to those. Um, but things like your pretzels can be broken in bits. It's perfectly fine. Um, a lot of this culture shift is actually about social norms. So we have created these social norms in the West and, and very much in the, U in the US about abundance. We've created a norm around throwing food away when it's not good. I mean, there's also, I think, a huge cultural disconnect between where our food comes from. People don't think about the people, the resources, the gas that Dana was talking about. Um, all, no one's thinking about how long it takes to grow this stuff. They just chuck it in the bin. They don't even think about the fact that it's going to a landfill, that it's contributing to the climate crisis. But that is, again, that's a cultural social norm. These are things that can be shifting even in our education system as young as children to teach them the connections between where their food comes from. I personally think it's also related to a dip in religion. People used to 
right? More commonly say a prayer before eating, saying thank you, thinking about that journey. That's become less and less common in American culture. And I think that's also a part of that kind of shift in the culture norm. We've also created a norm that food has to be beautiful and it has to be whole and it has to be perfect. Um, there is no reason to think that that culture norm can't change. It just has to sh change with the right storytelling and the right framing. Um, but social norm messaging, which is something we do work on a lot at Food for Climate League because it's so powerful in terms of driving behavior change, it can really create this sense of a shared value system, but also kind of shared shame, guilt. <laughs> if you're not participating in something, it can make you feel like you're missing out if you're not participating in something. Um, there's all different ways to be telling the story that all need to be targeted very differently depending on who the audience of focus is. Um, there's all different ways that we can tap into this, but there's no reason to think that culture can't shift in this direction because again, it will benefit us in so many ways from a cost perspective, from a community perspective, from a, a purpose perspective. Yeah, I mean, I can add, Eve, I, I think you just said it so well, of like there's this big culture change of how we think about the world and, you know, Imperfect we're a food company. And so like, we're sort of at this intersection of we're able to use the research and the data that Emily and Dana and, you know, Carrie, everyone's putting out to sort of, there's this fear and scare in the world of this problem is so big, what can we do? And so we're able to help, you know, consumers say, here's one solution. Um, and there's all this, you know, backup of why you need to help eliminate food waste. A lot of that's at home too. And so there's this other huge piece of how can we help you eliminate food waste at home? And that is so much bigger than one person, right? There's so much information and knowledge that we need to put out, whether it's resources, whether it's recipes, whether it's meal prepping, shopping, all of this cultural change. But I say that there's sort of this, how the world problem of climate change that we're also scared of and how do we tap into that? There's that cultural piece. And then there's the sort of what you've tapped on or sort of hinted at, which is how can we get to thinking about, um, you know, it's what's on the inside and sort of go back to this larger cultural piece where we're being kind again, because this food system is really benefiting a few um, and it's not open, opening doors for everyone. And so how can we think about shapes, sizes, imperfections, and also quantities and location and places and all these other sort of attributes of the food system that we're being shut out of. And so we're in this funny middle space of imperfect where we get to sort of think about the climate piece and then also think about the sort of activist movement um, that you know Gen Z is way ahead of, which is you know not definitely our customer just yet, um, but really think about how can we rethink what the food system is and rethink like, you know, we started our marketing team was incredible at the beginning of putting googly eyes on fruits and veggies and saying like, you know, just because there's sort of funny colors or, you know, a third eye on your eggplant or, you know, a weird twist on your carrot, that doesn't mean it's not fun. And so we really went this lovable route where we really want people to love their food. And I think that that was the beginning of this culture shift that is way beyond just imperfect, but it's so much bigger of how can we get back to loving food, respecting food, respecting resources. And that sort of is that natural um, bridge into how do we respect our planet and everything that went into growing food. And so it's so much bigger than just where each of us sits on this chain of the food system, but it does get back to how can we rethink it? And again, can't do that alone. And so grateful for everyone on this panel, but also, listening and sort of beyond these four walls of digital space, <laughs> just to think about it, it really is taking us all to rethink this. Yeah, and it's incredible that as we look at, um, from a Hellman's perspective, at least on I mean, behavior change, we, we just about to launch a behavior change program in, in the United States. And just with simple things like breaking recipes down into what we're calling this three plus one model uh, into basic, very basic, simple steps people are being able to reduce their food waste from anywhere to, you know, 30 to 35%. And it's, it's, it's remarkable that very small things can make a difference. And again, going back to your point, Eve, on, on the empowerment of that, we have the power to change this. We don't have to just look at it as a calamity and sit down and not do anything. So that's, um, thank you for that. So let's talk about, so we've obviously talked a lot about the opportunities, but let's talk a little bit about what are some of the limitations on, on putting the onus on consumers? So we've talked a lot, even you did particularly on the individual, but what are some of the limitations of doing that? 
please feel free to jump in whoever would like to to kick off yeah i mean i i think i can start with the retailer yes. perspective um I think it's incredibly um, important to not only put the onus on customers, right? Like as the food retailer where people come to shop and to learn and to experience food, I think there's a big opportunity for us to help guide the customer in the direction to which we think we need to go. And so what are we doing to put items on the shelves that without them even knowing it have a huge impact on the on their footprint or how are we communicating to them the difference that this product is making on their individual food? footprint. So um, I think it's a huge responsibility on the the um, CPGs and the retailers to help um, that push and pull, right? Like we don't want to put anything on the shelf that a customer won't buy, but we also want to help guide them um, in the direction of, of this new, more sustainable food system. And so it's a very um, balanced approach, but I think it's a really important one. And so that's one of the reasons, you know, we're really focused on upcycle products because they do have that reduced um, impact on the environment, but they're delicious, right? Like you, like you don't, you don't buy it for the impact, you buy it because it's delicious and the benefit is this impact that you're having. So um, as we can continue to drive that and bring um, these more, sustainable products to our shelves and make them uh, marketable and delicious and tell that narrative. I think it's really, really powerful. Um, then that onus is on us, but the, the customer reaps the benefits of it, right? Sure. Yeah, I'm happy to add to that quickly. Please. But um, I think there, I really see kind of two essential things that government businesses have to be doing in this space when it comes to supporting the, the everyday individual. One is by reducing barriers, right? And that's what Emily was really talking about in terms of these policy shifts. This is about people who want to engage, have limited time, lots of stress in their lives, want to do the right thing. How do you reduce the barriers for them to participate? Whether that's education, like you were just talking about, right? Providing something that's really uh, clear, skill building. A lot of people just don't know how to use some things that are left in the fridge. They don't know how to put the recipe together, how to utilize it. But then there's also this really important part of collective action of inspiring people and saying, you're not alone in this journey, that X, Y, and Z businesses, X, Y, and Z governments, we are all working on this together, which I think is what's so exciting about Kroger's initiatives and, and so many other companies um, and governments around the world. I, I'd love to just give like one really specific example that ties back to date labeling, which is, you know, consumers often ask, or even like local government that, that are saying, how can we educate people about knowing now that most of these dates are about quality, like what is the message for people? And I think that's a really good example where it's hard to give people a clear message right now because there's like kind of ma'am on labels. So I should say, you know, there's a really good effort on the part of industry to have voluntary standards. Now a lot of um, manufacturers and retailers have signed on to that, but still, if you go to a store, you can't be sure that a food is labeled in accordance with this you know, voluntary initiative, or if it's just someone who's like, doesn't know what they're, lab you know, isn't labeling properly. And it's been, you know, I, I think there's a lot of places where um, we can't make things easy for consumers who want to do the right thing. And then I would say also, I think, you know, there's, there's a lot of like waste happening unnecessarily at various parts of the food chain that even before it happens to consumers too. So I think there's, um, you know, lots of opportunities at all the levels, but um, but I think just focusing on consumers would leave a lot on the table. We can I can tell that Dana's dying to say something, so Dana, please jump in. Well, I'm sure we want to get on to the next question, but I would just add there there's a key interplay right between consumers and businesses, and it goes both ways, right? And so yes, there is a huge amount of food going to waste in people's homes. Um, but also the, the culture shift that, that Eve was talking about, that has a huge impact on the way businesses operate, right? And I'm sure all the businesses on the phone would agree. If I'm a consumer and I walk into a grocery store and expect that I can get one of, you know, 500 different time, types of, of produce at 8.59, the minute before they close, like that means that store has to carry all that stuff, right? And, and imagine the inventory challenge of doing that. And, and, you know, similarly, if I'm a consumer, I walk into a restaurant, I'm not that hungry, but all I can order is a plate of pasta that's this big, you know, I'm kind of stuck, right? And so I think there is just this key interplay and I don't think we can easily divide between what consumers need to be doing and what businesses need to be doing because there's just a, a real connection and inherent there. 
Thank you, Jenna. So the, we have a question coming in from the audience and, and, and whoever can, you know, wants to join and please do. But what does, what is the role that technology plays in reducing food waste? The question actually was very specific in the retailer space, Carrie. So maybe you want to jump yeah, on. Yeah, I did, I, did, I did say it was originally for Coker. So I'll talk. And then I think Maddie probably has a really good perspective too sure. on it. And so absolutely. I think, um, he specifically or she specifically called out um, e-com and the difference e-com can make from a technology perspective. And I think that's a really important call out. Um, brick and mortar stores, to Dana's point, do you really need to rely on that like abundance feel in the in the store. Like if someone walks into our produce section and there's not much left on the shelf, they assume it's the worst stuff that's left, right? Because everyone else has picked through it. So like this abundance mentality is really um, noticeable in the brick and mortar from an e-commerce perspective, it's much less important. And so we actually um, have opened a few and are planning to open more of these um, micro fulfillment centers uh, where you're doing online pur purchasing and it gets delivered directly to your home. And it's based on the Ocado system that started in the UK. We brought that over here using a lot of their technologies. Um, and in the, in the UK, since they've been up and running for a long, really long time, they have a very reduced um, food waste footprint and shrink footprint. Um, and so we're really hopeful that that will help drive a lot more efficiency into our supply chain because of that fact of like, people are more predictive when it's online ordering, right? You're less distracted by the shiny objects in the store. And um, so that online ordering is much more predictive. It allows us to be much more adequately stocked without that, that overabundance factor. Um, so definitely think it's going to have a huge impact moving forward. Um, Maddie, do you want to talk about like, obviously technology is like driving a lot of your business as well. Yeah, um, couldn't agree more just on the abundance piece. I think the, the other thing that most folks don't think about with e-com, which maybe is a different side of technology, is just um, actual temperature. So like our stores, when I go into our fulfillment centers, I am in my winter coat no matter what day or month of the year it is, no matter what state I'm in. Um, and because we're keeping all the product at its ideal temperature, um, we can actually have longer shelf life for the customer. So we don't keep it longer per se, but you get longer time in your fridge. Um, and so, you know, every time I walk into a grocery store, no matter where I am, and if I see berries in the front, because they're trying to help me purchase them quicker, it just, it eeks me because I'm like, berries need to be in the cold. And so if we can keep all of our product in the right temperature zone, it actually, you know, enables product to last longer um, because it's in its, you know, ideal home state. And so I think everything around keeping things in the right temperature, you know, better predictive analysis, and then forecasting is so key. Um, you know, all online grocers are sort of e-com is working harder and harder at that as our brick and mortar, but the more predictive analysis we have on how many customers are going to have shopping or purchasing certain items based on seasonality, which is sort of gets to Dana's push pull of what are we offering and what are customers buying. Um, but those are sort of the three really um, honed in areas that we work on to have less food waste and think that it's sort of the future of e-com. That's interesting, Maddie. you talk about forecasting because we honestly on, on Hellman's and many of the foods brands at Unilever, we keep getting challenged with, you've got to forecast better because we don't want to have obsolete waste and we don't want to have factory waste. But it's actually really great that we're all thinking about, you know, all the different aspects that ladder up to creating such immense amounts of waste and, and breaking it down into bite sized pieces so that we can actually, we can actually digest them. So, um, I want to end on a very positive note. So I would love to hear from each one of you individually on what are some of the things that you are excited about? So why don't we start, Eve, with you? And what is something that you look at in the future and feel really excited and feel that we will make an impact? Well, I mean, the thing that gets me up every morning is this beautiful interplay uh, between food and climate that addresses human health planetary health and human mental health. So our physiological nutrition, um, but also our mental well-being. And there are so many aspects of tackling food waste that are just beautifully contributing to all three of those different areas. And I'm really excited by the initiatives that are happening at every single level here. And this was a great panel because I think we had all of those levels, you know, represented in, some, in one way or another. Um, and now I feel like the we do need to start kind of shifting the narrative for the general public so that, especially after this summer of uh, climate catastrophes, where I think a lot of people who had felt like, oh, this wasn't going to impact me, are realizing that it, that it 
is going to impact them, it is going to impact their food, um, that they have a really clear cut way of engaging and that it's again framed in the positive as something that's really exciting and scintillating and delicious um, to take a part of that's going to make a really big impact and put pressure on governments and companies to continue doing the right thing. Anybody else want to jump in? What is something that you look, you look at and you're super excited about the future? I'm excited that this panel exists. Yeah, you know, I was like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it just 10 years ago, this, this wasn't the conversation or even a five. And there's this imminence and there's the pressure of climate change. And there's the really sort of sort of darker, less optimistic conversations we can be having. But the fact that this group all exists across so many different platforms and different areas of business, and yet we're all able to interconnect and talk about this. Um, it, we're providing solutions across the board and there are so many more solutions not you know, currently represented. And that's what gets me excited, sort of the innovation and direction that we're all going towards the same place. And we have a North Star of what to be focusing on. Um, that, that gets me excited every day. <laughs> Yeah, I would, I would uh, echo that. I, I have been working on this for about 10 years and when it was just Emily and me and three other people, you know, I think we never would have believed that we would be sitting here with Kroger and Unilever, you know, talking about this issue or that like the national government would be considering putting almost a billion dollars into it through their policy or that there would even be goals or that the UN Food Summit, which happened yesterday, would be talking about food loss and waste is one of the key things we need to take action on. So I think there's a ton of momentum right now. And, um, and I think that's amazing. Um, my fear is that it doesn't, it, it gets lost in people not knowing what to do. And I think it, what's really important right now is that we give people clear actions to take so that they can harness that momentum. And, you know, just as Eve was saying, like really feel like they are doing something about it because there is something all of us can do in our personal lives and for many of us in our professional um, spheres of influence as well. And so just really um, driving to that clear, concise action is the next step, but uh, so exciting to see the momentum. I'll just jump in on that because I think I was going to say two things. One was the momentum and I think going back to, you know, I, when I was talking about something like the, the, ways that the federal government is taking steps in this direction. And it feels like there's, you know, there's a lot of opportunity right now. And I, I would say the work this year to kind of put out a unified voice on some of the policy things is to Dana's point, like, how can we be speaking? How can we be aligning? How can we be prioritizing and um, taking action? Um, the other thing from my vantage in academia that's exciting is like the number of students that are interested in this, not only my students at Harvard Law School, but you know, we have interns from around the country that come in summers and different times. And I get outreach a lot from students that are doing research. Like that is the future, you know, the, the, that this is, you know, um, not only going to change their own habits in, in the house, hopefully, you know, to kind of Eve's point, but also being leaders that are coming into their business and professional lives or like their research, looking at these questions and trying to take it those steps forward and pushing for change in their, um, in their, you know, personal and professional lives. So it's pretty awesome to be able to, you know, be in this place to get to see that energy that's coming forward too. Yeah. I will just say, I, um, do get a lot of sneak peeks from a lot of companies that are up and coming that are doing really amazing things in the food system, right? Like imperfect foods has been around for six years and they're amazing, but like, there are so many more in the pipeline uh, that are coming through. And, um, I'm just really excited to be able to work with those organizations and bring things to market, um, to help consumers shop more sustainably without even knowing it or with intention, right? That's the, the dream, but a lot of customers don't have the resources or the time to shop um, that consistently on the sustainable um, diet. And so being able to make it as easy and convenient and accessible as possible. Um, and so I'm really excited. Uh, I think the, the possibilities are endless uh, when it comes to, to shopping more sustainably in the future. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. And I can tell you what I'm super excited about. What I'm excited about is that everybody is questioning this. So when I, you know, I have the benefit from, uh, from being on Hellman's to talk to consumers, I talk to lots of consumers, and I see that whether you're in urban area or you're rural or you're cash-trapped or you're high-income, uh, whatever ethnic background you might have, 
uh, given what we have seen in the last 18 to 24 months, everybody is questioning their role and what they can do. Um, and that's what makes me feel very empowered uh, that you know we together can make a difference. So thank you all again for, for joining the panel and thank you for the audience uh, you know, for listening. Um, I think you know, we all want to make sure that you feel that you are all empowered. We are all empowered, whether we are at the individual level, the retailer, academia, nonprofits, businesses, government, uh, to make a difference in the space of reducing food waste and impacting climate change positively. So thank you for joining today. And um, we look forward to uh, continuing the discussion. Thank you, everybody.